In the first chapter of his prose life of Cuthbert, Bede recounts the story of the saint's allegedly profligate childhood. Until he was eight years old, Cuthbert had devoted himself to games and athletic contests in which he regularly surpassed all his friends. He gave up this childish play only when admonished by a three-year-old boy who wept and wailed at the sight, crying out that Cuthbert's antics were unfitting for someone who was destined to be a holy bishop and priest. Bede took the story from the anonymous life that was his source, but he characteristically framed it with his own scriptural illusion by comparing Cuthbert to the Old Testament prophet Samuel, who likewise in his boyhood did not yet know the Lord. When Cuthbert was older, however, he did come to know the Lord and receive God's word, Bede says, when once the ear of his heart had been uncovered. That phrase of Bede does not appear in the biblical story of Samuel, but it's reminiscent of the opening words of St. Benedict's rule. Listen, my son, to the precepts of the master and incline the ear of your heart. It would have been appropriate for Bede to echo the rule when anticipating Cuthbert's own conversion to monastic life, but he would also have read about the ear of the heart in many of his patristic sources, especially Augustine and Gregory the Great. For those writers, and for Bede himself, this was more than a poetic turn of phrase or a dead metaphor. In their understanding, references to the ear of the heart, the mind's eye, or even the throat of the heart, and other such terms, were meant to invoke a complex system of non-corporeal sensory perception that they considered integral to the Christian faith. Modern scholarship also often refers to this common theological understanding as the doctrine of the spiritual senses, but that label is misleading if it's taken to imply a formal status or a univocal interpretation for this idea. Different Christian authors have employed the concept of the spiritual senses in different ways, as shown in the studies in a volume edited by Paul Gavriliuk and Sarah Coakley in 2012. My purpose here is to explore the significance of the spiritual senses for Bede, which has not previously been noted as far as I am aware. Although I can't hope to match either her erudition or her eloquence, I aspire to follow Jennifer O'Reilly's example in tracing a thematic thread across Bede's corpus in order to show how it is embedded in the tapestry of his theology and spirituality. I was privileged to be in attendance at conferences where Jennifer presented her studies on Bede's use of island imagery and on his many references to seeing the God of Gods in Zion. I think also of her work on Bede's engagement with the tabernacle and the temple, the sign of Jonah, and Christ as the mediator between God and humankind. By calling our attention to each of these themes in Bede's writings, Jennifer showed us how he adapted patristic traditions to make his own points and advance his own agenda. Sometimes that agenda was political, sometimes doctrinal or reformist. In his treatment of the spiritual senses, I would describe Bede's agenda as pastoral and mystagogical. He wanted to guide and support his readers in their practice of the Christian life and to lead them more deeply into the mysteries of faith. In an important article on this theme in Byzantine authors, Marcus Plested has defined the so-called doctrine of the spiritual senses as the idea that there are within the human being faculties corresponding in some manner with the five physical senses, yet capable of direct apprehension of spiritual and divine realities. He then goes on to enumerate some of the principal issues about which there are differing opinions. What is the relationship <clears throat> between the physical senses and their spiritual counterparts? How many spiritual senses are there? Typically, the answer is either one or five. Does there come a point in the Christian's journey at which the spiritual senses themselves must be transcended? Must the physical senses be extinguished or radically transformed, or can we think of the spiritual senses as an intensification of the physical senses? Now, Bede never addressed any of these issues directly, but it will be good to keep them in mind 
because they provide a framework for identification and analysis. In some cases, it's difficult to discern how Bede would answer one of these questions, but there's no doubt about one of them. He counted five distinct spiritual senses closely corresponding to the physical senses and identified by those same names. He refers to the physical senses as outer and the spiritual senses as inner, following St. Paul's distinction between the inner person and the outer person. For example, in a homily on the healing of the deaf-mute in Mark 7, Bede says, We should also keep all of our senses of our inner as well as our outer selves pure, and adorned always with good works. When he names the five senses, whether physical or spiritual, he usually puts them in hierarchical order, beginning with sight, followed by hearing, taste, smell, and touch. This is a slight variation on the traditional ranking established by Aristotle, who put smell before taste and touch. Most of Bede's favorite patristic sources, including Augustine, followed Ar Aristotle on this, but there was the notable exception of Gregory the Great. Bede's customary elevation of taste over smell seems likely to be yet another instance of the power of Gregory's influence. Bede often insisted that the senses need to be healed and transformed, although it's not always clear whether he's speaking of the physical senses or the spiritual senses or both of them at once. He clearly has the spiritual senses in mind in a homily in which he comments on Jesus' declaration, I am the light of the world, from John 8. Speaking in the Savior's voice, Bede extrapolates on this verse by saying, Let them heal the eyes of their minds. Let them purify their ears with faith so that they may be worthy to look upon me. For blessed are the pure of heart since they will see God. He explains more about this healing of the senses in another homily on the prologue in John's Gospel, when he likens sinners who are ignorant of Christ to blind people who are bathed in the light of the sun, even though they can't see it. Through his incarnation, Christ applies for them the cure of salvation, so that they can see the light. In this way, Bede says, he gradually brought hearts purified by faith to the recognition of his divine image. There's a similar passage in Bede's commentary on 1 Samuel, where he says that the Lord healed the eyes of the heart of those who fail to recognize his divinity by applying the healing salve of his human humility. In all of these passages, Bede is talking about what was, for him, the most important function of the spiritual senses which was to enable Christian believers to recognize the incarnate Christ. As Jennifer O'Reilly observed, the image of Christ as mediator between God and humanity was a critical point for Bede, not only with regard to doctrinal purity, but also in the life of discipleship. As she put it, Bede repeatedly relates the incarnation to the moral and spiritual response required of the faithful that they seek to imitate the example of Christ's humanity in order to share in his divinity. In Bede's view, the transformation of the senses begins with the sacramental rite of baptism. When he spoke in that homily on the healing of the deaf-mute about the need to keep both the inner and the outer senses pure through good works, he immediately added, since all of us have been washed in baptism. In that same homily, Bede discusses a pre-baptismal ceremony on Holy Saturday that drew on the Markan narrative in which Jesus puts his fingers in the ears of the deaf-mute and puts his own saliva on the deaf-mute's tongue. According to the Gelasian sacramentary, the bishop was to perform an exorcism of the catechumens and then touch their nostrils and ears with spittle and say, Ephata that is, be opened to a sweet aroma. Bede explains that the saliva is, symbolizes the taste of heavenly wisdom. The touching of the nostrils indicates that those about to be baptized could embrace 
should embrace only the good odor of Christ. From 2 Corinthians 2. And the teaching of the ears means that they should listen to his words. All those who have been baptized in this way must strive to keep themselves pure or to cleanse themselves with tears of, re of repentance if they should ever go astray. The focus here is on the senses of hearing and smell, but in another homily on the Feast of Christ's Circumcision, Bede identifies the rite of circumcision as a type of Christian baptism, and then he systematically goes through each of the five senses of the exterior and interior person, citing biblical verses to indicate what it means for each sense to be uncircumcised. And then he goes through the list of the senses again, with biblical verses describing the virtuous life of those whose senses have been circumcised, with knives, Bede says, knives made from the rock of spiritual discipline, who is Christ. None of the early church fathers wrote a treatise on the spiritual senses, and neither did Bede. But this theme appears again and again throughout his works in various contexts. By way of illustration, I want to consider some passages in which Bede discusses the senses in relation to ethical behavior, scriptural interpretation, mystical contemplation, and the afterlife. Then I'll conclude with some reflections on the way in which Bede may have at least implicitly revealed his view of the relationship between physical sensation and spiritual transcendence. To put some of the questions I'll be asking in the language of modern scholarship, is the relationship between the physical senses and the spiritual senses only analogical, so that they operate in separate parallel spheres? Or is there perhaps an anagogical connection in which the physical senses provide an entry point or a staging ground for the exercise of the spiritual senses? In the terms of theological aesthetics, did Bede think that an appreciation for earthly beauty can lead us to apprehend the beauty of Christ? The Physical Senses and Ethical Behavior With his well-known penchant for number symbolism, Bede often took advantage of the established tradition that there are five senses, no more and no less. Some of his allegorical interpretations on this topic are quite, quite ingenious. For example, in his commentary on Genesis, he notes that Abram, the patriarch, was 75 years old when he left Haran for the Promised Land. There are seven gifts of the Holy Spirit and ten commandments of the law, so the number 70, which is the multiple of 7 and 10, signifies the perfection of good works that is only possible with divine assistance. The number 5, representing the physical senses, is then added to make Abram's age of 75, in order to show that everything he did in his body was in observance of the commandments with the help of the Spirit. A variation on the same theme appears in Bede's commentary on the 85 righteous priests who were slain by Doeg the Edomite in 1 Samuel. This time Bede adds the number 10 of the commandments to the number 7 of the gifts of the Holy Spirit to make the sum of 17, and then multiplies that by the number 5, representing the senses, to make a total of 85. Therefore, says Bede, all those of courageous spirit who by seeing anything, or hearing something, or tasting something, or smelling something, or touching something, prevail in carrying out the commandments of law and grace and apply them to attaining the promised things. Sacred objects, as well as numbers, could remind Bede of the need to dedicate the senses to right living. One such object, described in his commentary on the tabernacle, has become famous due to its appearance in early medieval English art and archaeology. Commenting on the vestments of the high priest in Exodus 28, Bede quotes at length from the Antiquities of Josephus to provide a detailed description of the tiara, which he also calls a headdress or a mitre. The headdress of the high priest, which was situated on the top of his forehead and held in place by linen bands, 
is said to have featured a golden crown with three tiers, surmounted by a small golden calyx. This description fits rather well with the headdress worn by Ezra, depicted as a high priest, in a portrait in the 8th century Codex Amiatinus, which was produced at Wearmouth Jarrow during Bede's lifetime and almost certainly under his close supervision. In recent years, there has arisen the intriguing possibility that Bede might even have seen a physical replica of such a headdress. The very first object discovered in the Staffordshire ho Hoard in 2009 was a headdress mount that has been dated to the middle of the 7th century. In many details, it conforms to Josephus' description, which was also used by Bede. And we have no way of knowing whether there were any other such headdresses produced in early medieval England, and if so, whether Bede might have seen one. But the Staffordshire headdress is at least persuasive evidence that the headdress of the Old Testament high priest was a matter of English interest beyond Bede and his community. In a previous lecture in this series, Carol Farr has discussed Jennifer O'Reilly's investigations of exegetical traditions concerning the priestly headdress and their possible implications for our understanding of the Ezra figure in the Codex Amiatinus and similar figures in other insular manuscripts. As Jennifer wrote, Bede's interpretation of the breastplate, headdress, and other high priestly garments provides in particular a spiritual portrait of those chosen for leadership in the Lord's flock, having received the priesthood and the spiritual office of teaching. She was quoting there from Bede's commentary on the tabernacle. Just prior to his discussion of the headdress, Bede had explained that the white linen tunic symbolized both priestly continence and the right use of the sense of touch, which is, he says, common to the whole body. The headdress, then, recommends the consecration of the other four senses, which are all located in the head. The commentary here is a typical beaden string of biblical verses warning against the misuse of each of those senses, followed by another set of citations providing positive directions. He says, on the contrary, let his eyes be looking at equity. Let his ears be inclined to hear the words of prudence. Let the eloquences of the Lord be sweeter in his throat than honey and the honeycomb. As long as breath remains in him, let him neither speak iniquity nor depart from his innocence. And with regard to the fifth sense, which is common to the whole body, let him be careful to fulfill that prophetic command, depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing. This moral interpretation is followed then by the literal description drawn from Josephus, which contradicts the biblical account by saying that the little crowns atop the headdress were made of gold rather than fine linen. Either way, says Bede, it means that the priests keep their five senses chaste so that they may receive from God the promised crown of life. As we have seen, Bede's moral admonitions on the right use of the five senses focus on the physical senses of the body, which may be either circumcised or uncircumcised, either sanctified by grace or not. His discussion of the senses in other contexts often turns to the spiritual senses, as is clearly the case regarding the interpretation of Holy Scripture the spiritual senses, and biblical interpretation. When Bede cites a particular biblical verse with unusual frequency, that's often a clue to one of his predominating theological interests. And this seems to be the case with his use of Luke 24, 45, which comes at the end of that gospel, in the context of the resurrected Jesus instructing his disciples just before the ascension. I count at least 16 direct citations of that verse in Bede, compared to 28 in Augustine's much larger corpus, and only two in Gregory the Great. The verse is usually translated into English as, then he opened their minds to understand, to understand the scriptures. In Jerome's Vulgate, 
the Latin word for mind, here in the masculine singular accusative, is in fact sensum. Now, sensus can certainly connote the intellectual faculty, but it can also include sensation, perception, and feeling, as does our English word sense. In relation to understanding the Bible, we naturally think of the various levels of meaning beyond the literal or historical, which Bede and other medieval exegetes called the spiritual senses. There have been many studies of Bede's treatment of the spiritual senses that are embedded in the biblical text, but surprisingly little attention has been given to the transformed spiritual senses that must be exercised by the interpreter of Scripture. Typical of Bede's allusions to the Lucan verse is his comment on the Lord's instruction to Moses that he must make the tabernacle and its appurtenances in accordance with the pattern that had been revealed to him on the holy mountain. Bede notes that when Jesus appeared to his disciples after the resurrection, he opened their sensus so that they might be able to understand these things and the other secrets of the scriptures spiritually with their mind's eyes unveiled. What this means is explained in more detail in a homily on the Ascension when Bede says that the disciples' minds were opened so that they could understand plainly what the prophets had said obscurely and then pass that knowledge on to other believers. It takes divinely corrected spiritual vision to see how the New Testament is anticipated in the pages of the Old and how Old Testament prophecies are fulfilled in the words and deeds of Christ and the Apostolic Church. For Bede, the cautionary counterexample of impaired spiritual vision was the Jews, who in the time of Jesus and since have failed to acknowledge the divinity of Christ. Andrew Scheil has traced Bede's invocation of the anti-Judaic trope of the blind synagogue, especially in his commentary on the book of Tobit. The figure of Tobias represents the ancient nation of Israel in both its good and bad aspects. On the positive side, they eschewed idolatry and shared the law of God with their Gentile neighbors. But just as Tobias was physically blinded when some warm dung from a swallow's nest fell into his eyes, so had Israel in the time of Christ become spiritually blinded in their licentiousness and pride. At the end of the story, Tobias has his sight partially restored when his son smears some bile from a fish on his eyes. But a white film, like the membrane of an egg, comes out to obscure his vision. In Bede's interpretation, that white film represents the veil that St. Paul said still covers the hearts of the Jews when they hear the law of Moses read in their synagogues. Until they acknowledge that Christ has already come to redeem the world, as Bede hoped some of them eventually would do, their mental blindness will continue. Sensory metaphors for biblical interpretation also abound in Bede's commentary on the Song of Songs. In one well-known passage, he says that scripture is like a honeycomb that when squeezed by the interpreter drips the sweetness of spiritual understanding according to the literal, allegorical, moral, and anagogical meanings of the text. But he also applies the image of the honeycomb to the church's teachers, who know how to search out the sweetness of the spiritual senses within the sacred writings and to clarify it for the salvation of their hearers by preaching. When the song describes the bridegroom's throat <clears throat> as most sweet, Bede says that refers to the flavor of the Lord's words. Many people are able to read and hear those words and even analyze the mysteries of the faith contained in them. But, he says, you will find very few who truly savor this sweet taste in the palate of their hearts. Elsewhere in the song commentary, Bede's imagination shifts from taste to sight when he says that the bride of Christ has eyes as those of doves because her spiritual senses are endowed with understanding bestowed by the Holy Spirit. 
with the eyes of a dove, the symbol of the Holy Spirit, she is able to search out the mysteries of the scriptures, discern virtues from vices, and ascertain the paths of justice. The sense of smell is invoked when Bede says that the holy preachers, those stewards of God's word, are like the church's nose, because their olfactory function is keen to discern which actions or words burn with the good odor of Christ and which breathe the deadly stench of heresy. The spiritual senses in mystical contemplation and spiritual vision. Whenever Christians employ their spiritual senses to interpret the Holy Scriptures, they are also using the physical senses and to some degree as they read the words written on the page of a manuscript or hear the biblical text read aloud in church or in classroom. However, there are other uses of the spiritual senses that require no such embodied actions, but in fact demand the complete cessation of action. Such is the case with mystical contemplation. Bede implicitly contrasts these two applications of the spiritual senses when he is commenting on the, on the bride's exclamation in Song of Songs 2.8, the voice of my beloved. He writes, Although we are not yet permitted to gaze upon the face of our beloved, much has already been given to us in that we are refreshed from time to time by the sweetness of his words in the Holy Scriptures. And much is given to those who are allowed the even greater gift of having a pure mind's gaze lifted up to heaven, so that while still in the present time, they might have a not inconsiderable foretaste of the sweetness of the life to come. While hearing the word of the Lord in Scripture is a wonderful gift, Bede says, even better is turning the mind's gaze toward heaven in mystical contemplation. This too is a gift from God, but it does require a deliberate act on the part of the beholder. In Bede's words, the gift comes only to those who have opened, have learned to open the eyes of their heart for the contemplation of heavenly things. The bride of Christ must open the bosom of her mind to the taste of heavenly sweetness and throw open the door of her heart to enjoy the bridegroom's happy embrace. At the same time, the opening of the spiritual senses to heavenly delights necessarily entails a concomitant closure to earthly joys. Bede compares this asceticism of the mind to the act of a sleeper who closes the eyes of the body in order to see secret visions with the eyes of the heart, and then goes on to say that this devotion to heavenly love is a kind of death, for just as death kills the body, so also does the inner life of charity cut it off from exterior pleasures. As Scott de Gregorio has observed, although Bede derived much of his teaching about contemplation from Gregory the Great, he often put the emphasis on different points. One such difference was Bede's relatively, relative inattention to self-recollection and what De Gregorio has called the inner workings and slippery paradoxes of the spiritual life that so captivated Gregory. However, in his commentary on the Gospel of Luke, which was an early work, Bede quotes verbatim and at length from Gregory's Gospel homily on Jesus' parable about a man who invited people to a great dinner. Among those invited who begged to be excused was a man who said he had bought five yoke of oxen and he needed to try them out. Gregory and Bede following him explained that the oxen are the five senses of the body that are fascinated by exterior things and thus represent the vice of curiosity into other people's lives. The problem is that curiosity about external affairs keeps a person from attending to one's own inner self. Bede obviously agreed with Gregory since he inserted this quotation into his own commentary, but introspection and self-analysis were not typical of his approach. More often, his references to the preparation that are necessary, preparation that is necessary for contemplation, 
concern devotional practices such as prayers, vigils, fasting, and the giving of alms. By these means, Bede says in a homily on the Feast of St. John the Evangelist, the contemplative learns to be free of all affairs of the world and to direct the eye of his mind toward love alone. And he begins, even in the present life, to gain a foretaste of the joy of the perpetual blessedness which he is to attain in the future by ardently desiring it, and even sometimes insofar as is permitted to mortals, by contemplating it sublimely in mental ecstasy. This qualification regarding contemplation being only insofar as is permitted to mortals was important to Bede. In the Song Commentary, he discusses this at some length in expounding the verse in which the bridegroom says to the bride, Turn away your eyes from me, for they have made me flee away. For Bede, this means that Christians must remember that in this life no one can see the face of God and live. Paraphrasing the biblical text in the Savior's voice, he says, Those spiritual senses of yours, by means of which you have desired to know me perfectly, are not sufficient for you to comprehend me perfectly in this life, however high they try to climb. Because the spiritual senses cannot apprehend God's essence, Bede says, we must learn that the higher he is sought by the pure in heart, the more certainly is he comprehended as being incomprehensible. Besides the contemplative vision of God, the sanctified eye of the mind is also capable of other kinds of, of spiritual vision, and Bede records many such visions in his historical and hagiographical works. The most influential patristic treatment of visionary experience was in Bede's commentary on Genesis according to the letter, where he proffers his categorization of three kinds of visions, corporeal, spiritual or imaginative, and intellectual, that is, without any images at all. Although Bede knew that text of Augustine and used it extensively in his own commentary on Genesis, he never refers to that passage on visions. However, he does use Augustine's vocabulary in the ecclesiastical history when he tells the story of the healing of the nun Tortgith by a spiritual vision of the holy abbess Ethelbert, who had died some three years before. Most of the visions recounted by Bede are of this type, in which the mind's eye sees an image that appears to be in bodily form. Sometimes there is a question as to whether the appearance is a true spiritual vision, as when the nun Begu saw the soul of the abbess Hild being transported to heaven in the company of angels. Bede says that Begu was resting in the nun's dormitory at Hackness when she heard the ringing of the monastery bell and opened her eyes, presumably her spiritual eyes, to see the roof of the building rolled back and light coming in from above. Then she physically awoke and saw that none of the other sisters had been disturbed, so she knew that Hild's death had been revealed to her, Bede says, either in a dream or in a vision. When news came from Whitby the next morning, confirming that Hild had in fact died, Bede knew, Be Begu knew that it had been a true vision that she had received. Although Bede never cited Augustine's formulation about the three kinds of visions, in several places he did quote from Augustine's lengthy letter 147 to Paulina, which Augustine himself called a book on seeing God. In that text, Augustine had responded to Paulina's question as to whether the invisible God can be seen with the eyes of the body. He explained to her that in this life, it is impossible to see the fullness of God in his essence, but the patriarchs and prophets were able to see the images by which God willed to make himself known. Bede takes the same approach in his own interpretation of those biblical theophanies. As he says in one Advent homily, therefore the holy ones saw God through a subordinate creature, for example, fire, 
an angel, a cloud, or lightning. For those who are still contained within the weak vessel of the flesh can see him through circumscribed images of things, although they are by no means capable of looking at him through the uncircumscribed radiance of his eternity. This raises a further question about the kind of sensory organs that the patriarchs, prophets, and apostles used to see these images of divinity. In his commentary on Ezra and Nehemiah, Bede said that all those who have contemplated a partial vision of the joys the church will attain in heaven have purified the eyes of their heart. And in his commentary on 1 John, Bede quotes from one of Augustine's own homilies on that same book, let us, who, let us who wish to see God cleanse the eye of the heart by which God can be seen. The Spiritual Senses in the Afterlife Toward the end of his treatise on seeing God, Augustine considers the possibility that the saints in heaven will see God with their bodily eyes. He's somewhat open to the idea that in the resurrection of the dead, human flesh will be transformed into spirit in such a way that God will be seen with the eyes of that spiritual body. But his preferred view is that of Ambrose, who said in his commentary on Luke that God is seen not with bodily eyes, but by a pure heart. B. doesn't take up this question, but since he quotes other sections of these passages from both Augustine and Ambrose, it's safe to assume that he agreed with them on this point. In heaven, the vision of God as he is, in his essence, will be granted only to the spiritual eyes of the heart. There won't be any physical senses operating in the afterlife for the wicked either, according to what Bede, drawing from the 6th century Bishop Primatius, says in his commentary on the book of Revelation. What is fair to the sight, harmonious to hearing, smooth to the touch, sweet to smell, and delectable to taste, shall pass away from this world. Bede's ecclesiastical history contains two famous accounts of otherworldly journeys that are interesting to consider in relation to this question of the spiritual senses. The Irish monk Fursa was lying ill on his bed when he was taken out of the body into heaven, where he saw choirs of angels and heard them singing. Two days later, he left his body a second time when the angels took him on a tour of the fires of hell, where he saw souls in torment and was threatened by demons. In the life of Fursa that was Bede's source, it stated that Fursa had died, taken his journeys in the spirit, and then come back to life. He must have seen his visions with the spiritual senses then, because he was out of the body at the time. Curiously, when he returned to his body, Fursa bore for the rest of his life the mark of the burns he had suffered at the hands of one of the demons, suggesting that spiritual sensations can be transmitted into physical manifestations. Bede's account of the vision of Drichthelm makes it clear that he too had died temporarily before undertaking an otherworldly journey to purgatory, hell, paradise, and heaven. His story is even more full of sensory details than that of Fursa. Drichthelm sees human souls tossed about like sparks in the flames of hell, hears the wails of the damned and the mocking laughter of the demons, and smells a horrible stench coming up from the abyss. Then as he comes near to the outskirts of heaven, he sees a marvelous light, hears the sweet sound of singing voices, and is treated to the most wonderful fragrance. There may be no bodily sensations in the world to come, but according to Bede, the spiritual senses of the just will savor an abundance of sensory delights, while the depraved senses of the damned will suffer the pains of hell for all eternity. Bodily sensation and spiritual perception. Analogical or anagogical. 
Now that we've seen how B treated sensory experience in various contexts, I want to conclude by asking whether he understood the relationship between bodily sensation and spiritual perception as purely analogical, or at least to some extent also anagogical. Did he think that there is a real continuity between the physical and spiritual senses? To ask the question in a slightly different way, can the things humans see, hear, taste, smell, and touch with their physical senses provide a direct path to the Christian's spiritual goal? Or must bodily sensation always be transcended, perhaps even denied, so that the spiritual sensorium can be fully engaged? It seems to me that the record in Bede's writings is somewhat mixed, with the preponderance of the data following on the analogical side, but with some tantalizing hints of a more positive affirmation of bodily sensation as a direct path to what lies above and beyond. Indeed, it would have been incongruous for a theologian with Bede's passionate devotion to Christ incarnate, fully God and fully human, to reject the body and its sensory experience absolutely. His teachings on creation, incarnation, and resurrection clearly affirm the goodness of the body and the promise of its redemption. But when giving practical advice about the path to spiritual growth, Bede was more likely to recommend disciplines of bodily restraint and the, de and the denial of pleasures, such as prolonged vigils, fasting, continence, and the custody of the eyes. If we were to survey the general populace in Western secular culture today about physical sensations that have led them into the realm of transcendence, I expect the most frequent responses would have to do with the joy of sex, the beauty of the natural world, and aesthetic experience through the arts. There is, however, very little suggestion in the pages of Bede's writings that earthly pleasures such as these can be the gateway to spiritual joy. As a celibate monk, Bede kept his appeal to sexual experience firmly on the analogical plane, even or especially when discussing the lush, erotic imagery of the Song of Songs. For Bede, when the bride in the song hears her beloved knocking at the door, that's an invitation for Christians to rouse, arouse themselves to make progress in virtues. When she rises to open to the beloved, that means that the church is going out to preach the word of the Lord. Human sexuality provided Bede with powerful, powerful metaphors for the spiritual life. And he affirmed that married persons are called to follow Christ and can even achieve a form of perfection appropriate to their station. But he never wrote about earthly passion as something that directly leads to heavenly bliss. Nor do we find Bede rhapsodizing very often on the beauty of nature as a stimulus for contemplation. It's true that the first chapter of the ecclesiastical history extols the rich fecundity of the island of Britain, and many of Bede's commentaries draw on Pliny's natural history for a description and analysis of various animals and plants and the phenomena of earth, sea, and sky. There's also one remarkable passage in On the Tabernacle where Bede says that the curtain of the heavenly sanctuary described in the Epistle to the Hebrews must be even more lovely than the one in the ancient tabernacle of Moses. He writes, For if you consider the blazing splendor of the stars, or the manifold beauties of the clouds, or the rainbow that trails a thousand different colors before the sun, Will you not see for yourself that they delineate pictures set in a heavenly tapestry of colors, which are more numerous by far and more beautiful than those which are woven into the curtain of the tabernacle? As far as I can tell, this is the closest that Bede comes to waxing lyrical about the beauty of nature, even though in this case he's talking about the abode of the heavenly sanctuary in which Christ offers the sacrifice of his blood for all eternity. But in Bede's writings, for the most part, the appreciation of nature's ability to lead someone into communion with the Creator remains implicit at best. 
Typical is the story of Cuthbert constructing his, heritage, his hermitage on Inner Farn, with the walls so high around him that he could see nothing but the sky above. Thus, uh, thus Bede says, restraining both the lust of the eyes and of the thoughts, and lifting the whole bent of his mind to higher things. Even in the verse epigraph for his treatise On the Nature of Things, Bede appears to stay in the analogical mode when he says, You who study the stars above, fix your mind's gaze, I pray, on the light of the everlasting day. As far as the arts are concerned, we know that Bede was an accomplished poet, hymn writer, and storyteller. There's good reason to think that he was instrumental in designing the illustrations for deluxe manuscripts produced at Wearmouth Jarrow, including the Codex Amiatinus. Did he recognize the power of aesthetic experience not only to inform, but also to inspire and transform? Bede's famous defense of images in the commentary on the tabernacle is usually read with an emphasis on the didactic function of images in representing biblical stories and typologies for the benefit of those who are illiterate. But in that same passage, Bede also says that holy images tend to elicit compunction in those who view them. And in his account of the panel paintings on the church wall at Wearmouth in the history of the abbots, he says that Benedict, Benedict Biscop intended that all who enter the church should always gaze on the lovely sight of Christ and his saints, so that they would either recall the grace of Christ's incarnation or be moved to self-examination. B describes the iconographic program at St. Peter's, Peter's Wearmouth in some detail, so we can infer that he was thinking viewers would ponder the grace of the Incarnation when they saw images of the Virgin Mary and the Apostles around the apse, and scenes from the Gospels on the south wall. When they turned to the north wall, they would be prompted to self-examination by visions from the Book of Revelation. The reference to the lovely sight of Christ and his saints reminds us of Bede's frequently expressed desire to see Christ the King in his beauty, an allusion to Isaiah thirty-three seventeen. The whole discussion gives us some idea of how Bede would have expected viewers to approach the Christ in majesty page in the Codex Amiatinus. With feelings of awe, and loving devotion, as well as sorrow for their sins. Finally, we should also note that for Bede, the most intense aesthetic experiences seem to have come in the context of liturgical worship. Besides his references to panel paintings in the churches of Wearmouth and Jarrow, there are two homilies in which he talks about the aesthetic dimension of liturgy. The first is a homily on the Magnificat, which concludes with Bede's commendation of the custom of chanting Mary's song each day at Vespers, so that in this way a very frequent reminder of the Lord's incarnation may enkindle the minds of the faithful to a feeling of devotion, and by reflecting very often on the example of his mother, they may be confirmed in the stability of virtues. Bede says this is especially appropriate in the evening when we are ready to enter a time of quiet reflection with prayers and tears and cleanse our minds after the distractions and errors of the day. The other homily is for the Feast of the Dedication of the Monastic Church. On this occasion, Bede says, the monks joyfully sing more psalms than usual at the night office. They hear some additional readings and they find the church decorated with many candles and other unspecified adornments on the walls. All this splendor should inspire the monks to adorn their hearts with good, with good works, so that they will show forth not only the outward appearance of piety, but rather its power. There is analogy here, to be sure. As the church is outwardly adorned with beautiful ornaments and ceremony, the monks should furnish the inner sanctuary of their hearts 
with the love of God and neighbor. And then the homily concludes with a brief synopsis of Bede's allegorical interpretation of the Temple of Solomon, provided, he says, so that these details, spiritually understood, might arouse our minds to more ardent love of our heavenly dwelling place. Characteristically of Bede's theological aesthetics, the beauty experienced in art, architecture, music, and ritual action here points back to Holy Scripture. And the splendors displayed to the physical senses are meant to be translated into things seen and done by the spiritual senses on another level. But there is something of an anagogical movement here as well, a way in which the delights of physical sensation can inspire the mind and move the heart to seek the things that are above. Bede knew that sound doctrine and conscientious preaching would not alone suffice to bring people to the vision of God. That is why the Lord told Moses and, Sa and Solomon to construct beautiful houses for worship, gave the prophets figures and tropes to adorn their writings, and inspired the poet Cadman to cast the biblical stories into metrical verse. We can be sure that Bede would have agreed that the Christian gospel is good and it is true, but by God's providence, it is beautiful as well.